What's up, boys and girls? Um, it's restart day six today. Um, we're going to do chapters 12 and 13. A um, couple things before I get going. Make sure you guys are checking your social studies classroom. A lot of you guys are doing ELA and not doing social studies. So we need to be making sure we're doing social studies. Along with that, we need to make sure we're doing the um, music and art classes that we're in right now. Um, Miss Seymour and Miss Sizemore both posting things every single day for you guys to go and look at. Um, yeah, I think that's really it. Make sure you guys are doing both pages of the restart work every day. <clears throat> we we'll still have a lot, quite a few people doing just the first page. Um, and not scrolling down and doing page two. So make sure we are doing both pages, okay? Today we're doing chapters 12 and 13. Um, so only two chapters today. Um, remember every chapter starts with a different character's perspective as we get back into this. Um, so today we're doing chapter 12 and we're starting from Chase's perspective. So I'm gonna go ahead and get into it. Um, yeah, make sure you hop in the Zoom chat tomorrow if you have any questions. Or today, if you've seen this before, um, before uh, the Zoom chat at 11.30. So make sure you're hopping in there and getting your questions answered. All right. A few more memories have come back. Mostly, it's just images and impressions, but there's one that's pretty concrete. My mother has been showing me a lot of old pictures and hope that something might ring a bell. One snapshot of an ivy-covered building looks kind of familiar. <clears throat> the student union at Johnny's University, Mom explains. It triggers a flashback. It's not that I remember it, more like it's already in my head and I'm just noticing it now. Mom and 7th grade Chase are dropping Johnny off at college. Our car pulls around the long circular drive in front of the building in the photograph. Johnny gets out. It's his first day of freshman year, his first time living away from home. He seems terrified. And what do I feel? Sympathy for my poor scared brother? Or for my mom who's on the verge of tears? For myself, even, I'll be losing my brother to a new life in a faraway place. I don't feel any of those things. Instead, I'm thinking, what a wuss this kid is. I can't believe I ever looked up to him. What a wimp. What a baby. My scorn is so sharp that it jolts me back to the here and now. How could I have had such harsh judgments about my own brother? When I was in the hospital, Johnny was there at my bedside every minute, Mom was. Just as worried about me. Just as tore up by my accident. I guess that wasn't payback for the wonderful brotherly loyalty I've shown him over the years. People say I've changed. I'm barely beginning to understand how much. Dr. Cooperman isn't surprised that my memory is returning. My brain is totally fine, he says at the next appointment. After all, I remember everything that's happened since coming out of the coma. Not that it would be easy to forget things like Shoshana dumping frozen yogurt on my head or Brendan going through the car wash on a tricycle or how it felt to push Joey against the wall, a blur of violence, anger, and lightning fast action, and something else too. I may not be proud of it, but it's the truth. Satisfaction. I didn't like the way the situation was going, and I changed it with my own physical power. Aaron's words come back to me. You didn't have to attack him, and Shoshana's goon. That haunts me a little. I don't regret stopping Joey from bullying Brendan, but was fighting really the only way to make that happen. Worse, I didn't even consider trying to talk Joey down. I just grabbed the kid and manhandled him the way he was manhandling Brendan. I get that the old Chase could be like that before the accident, but now I'm starting to wonder if that person is still inside me, emerging from the darkness bit by bit along with my memory. As weird as it was to lose my past, this might be even weirder. The more that comes back, the less I recognize myself. Dr. Cooperman also pronounces me fully recovered physically. Then he drops the bomb. He still wants me off the football team for the rest of the season. I must seem pretty devastated because he adds, it's all out of an abundance of caution. You're fine, but concussions can't be taken lightly. We're learning new things about the long-term effects every day. I know you're disappointed, honey, my mom adds. I understand how important football is to you. How can I explain it to them? Sure, I'd love to play, but what really bugs me is that my biggest is that football is my biggest connection to my old life. I don't think I've had a single conversation with Dad that wasn't about either my past gridiron glories or the ones he still expects me to have. 
And since the incident with Joey, the only Hurricanes who will talk to me are Aaron and Bear. Even with them, half the time, I get the impression that their main interest is getting their team captain back. For sure, those guys are never going to forgive me for A, doing my community service when I don't have to, and B, not hating it enough. To be honest, I don't hate it at all. One thing no one ever tells you when you're laid up, like I was in the hospital, is how boring it is. You really appreciate anybody who comes to break the monotony. So now I get to be that person for the resist residents of Portland Street. It makes me feel good about myself. And that's a huge at a time when I'm learning I have so much to feel bad about. Besides, I get stuff out of it too. I've learned how to play Mahjong and I've picked up a lot of great tips on how to grow stuff. Mostly from Miss Kittredge, whose room looks like a botanical garden. I think I'm going to be able to save a lot of mom's plants and maybe even the ficus in Helene's room. The one she bought at her preschool flower sale and is at least 98% dead. That'll make points with Corinne, who is losing her enthusiasm for fallen leaves of the tiny white bugs that are all over them now. As for Mr. Solway, <clears throat> despite the fact that I've forgotten most of what's happened to me, I feel confident saying he's the coolest person I've ever met. Anyone who could jump onto a moving enemy tank, throw open the hatch, and take it out with a grenade has to be a pretty amazing guy. Mr. Solway doesn't see it that way. <clears throat> That's what I did, not who I am. If I'd bothered to think about it, I wouldn't have done it. I'm not that stupid. The sad part is that Mr. Solway can't find his Medal of Honor. Nurse Duncan thinks it probably got misplaced during Portland Street's big repainting project and it will turn up sooner or later, but he's convinced he flat out lost it. I haven't been as sharp since my wife died, he tells me. We never had kids, so we were the whole world to each other. She looked after everything and I looked after her. He sighs. You can see which one of us did a better job. When she was gone, that's when my life pretty much ended. This, a sweep of his arm takes in the room, is marking time. I hate it when he talks like that. Come on, Mr. Solway, you've got a good life here. Plenty of friends. He glares at me. Have you ever asked me about have you ever asked about me around this place? Old ladies on cut crutches do hundred yard dash when they see me coming. I've got my own personal table for one in the dining room. The nurses all call me Mr. Happy Face. They think I don't know because they assume I'm just as deaf as everyone else's in this funny farm. I'm getting the sense that before my accident, I was kind of Mr. Happy Face at my school. I confide to him. I could have told you that, he replies. When you first showed up here, you were just like those other two good-for-nothings. Maybe the worst of the three. Sometimes a whack on the head is exactly what a fellow needs. It's pretty harsh to say to someone with amnesia, but that's just the way Mr. Solway is. He isn't being mean. He's being honest. He's lived a long time and been through a lot, and he doesn't feel like he has to pull any punches. I respect that more than anything. That whack on my head cost me 13 and a half years of life, I reminded him. Remembering is overrated, he assures me. You know that heroic act that earned me the fancy medal? I don't remember one second of it. The only reason I know what happened is from the report my captain filed with headquarters. I guess when you get older, it's hard to hang on to every detail, I offer. He shakes his head. It is an old age. It's looking into a T-34 tank after a grenade's gone off inside. Not a pretty sight. That was the medic's explanation, anyway. You block out what you can't face. They were the enemy, I say gently. There was a war on. They're always the enemy when they're shooting at you, kid. But a dead man doesn't care what uniform he's wearing. I'm better off forgetting the whole rotten business, metal and all. That's another thing I have in common with Mr. Solway. We're memory loss buddies. I wonder if I've locked out what a jerk I used to be because I can't face it. I don't think it's the same thing, though. Besides, my lost past has started to come back. I wouldn't exactly call it a tsunami of recollection, more like the water torture, where the blindfolded prisoner feels a drip on his head just often enough to drive him crazy, anticipating the next one. I can't be sure they're real memories, blowing out candles at what you could have been sorry, blowing out candles at what could have been one of my birthday parties, a view of the Hollywood sign that might have come from our family trip to California, being crushed under a dog pile of football players, a flashback to one of my sports triumphs. Who can tell? My mind plays tricks on me. Last night I had a dream about cherry bombs going off inside a piano, scaring some poor kid half to death, and woke up in a cold sweat. But when I checked the school yearbook for a picture of Joel Weber, he wasn't the guy in my dream. There was no memory. 
just the product of a guilty conscience. My theory is my brain invents fake memories of things I heard about because I'm trying so hard to remember stuff. I even had a nightmare from the Korean War and for sure I was never there. I actually saw myself in uniform, climbing up the side of the tank like Mr. Solway did. I yank open the hatch and pull the pan on my grenade, but when the soldiers inside look up at me, I can't bring myself to drop it on them. I just hang there, not knowing what to do, until the grenade goes off in my hand. Believe it or not, the impression from before my accident that seems the most vivid is that little girl. Sometimes so much so that I feel like I should be able to reach out and touch the white lace on her blue dress and the red ribbon in her hair. I have to question whether she's any more real than the dreams. She never moves. She just stands there. Not looking at me, but off to the side somewhere. She must be important, though. She's the one image that was still with me when I woke up in the hospital. I wonder who she is. School triggers a few memories, too, but they're mostly random images and feelings of deja vu. There's nothing solid enough to be useful. I still don't really know the faculty, the kids, or the custodians. I'm just now learning my way around the building. I've been attending since sixth grade. I obviously don't remember what a lousy student I was because my teachers are so impressed with how well I'm doing now. Some of them seem like they're ready to faint when I actually hand in a homework assignment. Video Club is the one place that's brand new to me because it actually is. We've collected a ton of footage for the yearbook. I'm lagging behind the other members since most kids run a mile when they see me coming. I always shout, Brendan sent me, so they'll know I'm not looking for trouble. Miss DeLeo wants me to work on my interviewing skills because my subjects seem ill at ease. Yeah, no kidding. They're all waiting for me to pull their underwear up over their head and stuff them into the nearest locker. At least the videos are getting used the video kids are getting used to having me around. Except Shoshana, who hates me for good and always. I can't blame her, even though I have no memory of what Aaron Bear and I did to her brother. It's pretty strange to be despised for something that in your mind never happened. And to someone, it seems like you never met. She stopped fighting with me directly. Mostly, she makes up pointed comments about how the club should have closed up membership while they had the chance. That's unfair because I'm not even the last to join. Kimmy got here after me, and if I'm a newbie, I don't know what you call her. She doesn't know how a cam. She doesn't know a camera from a kumquat. For her interview with the head cheerleader, she left the lens cap on, so there was audio. And no video. On her second try, she zoomed in so close that all you could see was a mouth talking. I think Brendan has a kind of crush on Kimmy because he won't hear anything bad about her. Shooting a mouth but no face is expressionism, and lens caps are too analog for a digital age. Whatever. Brendan's true love, though, is YouTube. This afternoon, he shows us his latest clip of a tiny goldfish bravely swimming against the pool of a bathtub drain while electric guitars roar in the background. Just as the struggling creature is about to be sucked away to doom, the toilet plunger slams down over the drain opening, saving his life. Brendan pauses the video to scattered applause. I call it plunger ex machina, he announces grandly. Shoshana doesn't approve. You're wasting your time with this stuff. You should be helping me with my entry for the National Video Journalism Contest. It would be a huge boost for the club if we win. He brushes her off. The kind of internet traffic I'm trying to generate isn't going to come from senior citizens reminiscing about the good old days. <clears throat> it depends on who we pick, Shoshana insists. Seniors have lived through amazing times and accomplished incredible things. We just have to find the perfect subject. Before I'm realizing who I'm talking to, I blurt out, you should talk to Mr. Solway at, over at Portland Street. Her angry eyes skewer at me. I've contaminated her precious project with the sound of my voice. Another of my crimes against humanity, like bullying her brother and not dying when I fell off the roof. Who's Mr. Solway, Kimmy adds. A hero from the Korean War. He was awarded the Medal of Honor. That's the highest award any soldier can get. And how would you know someone like that, Shoshana demands. It obvious, it's obvious she doesn't believe a word out of my mouth. I work there. Aaron Bear and me. It's our community service for... My voice trails off. So, of all people, she knows exactly what we're doing community service for. He sounds perfect, Brendan agrees. Maybe I can get him to ride a tricycle through the car wash, Shoshana retorts icily. At least talk to the guy, Hugo prods. Miss DeLeo wades into a play peacemaker. I know you'll find a way to make the school proud, she says to Shoshana. And thank you, Chase, for a marvelous suggestion. Shoshana's cheek darkened through pink and red to full crimson. 
I hope I never hate anybody as much as this girl hates me. Chapter 13. We're on to Shoshana Weber. And there is some of that, um, like the chat she does with her brother on here. So whenever I say like JW Piano Man and Shosh 466, you know it's their, their chat thing. I get it. We're nerds. The video club, I mean. We own it, too. Take something meant as an insult and be proud of it. Nerd power. After all, the shoe totally fits. We wouldn't be as happy in doing whatever it is the so-called cool people do. That's how I look at it, anyway. We are who we are, and we're good with it. I figured the others felt the same way. Who cares what the popular kids think of us? Was I ever wrong about that? As soon as someone from the A-list showed even the slightest interest in Video Club, we all went weak in the knees and lined up to love him. My friends used to act like attention from the cool people meant nothing to them because they never actually thought they'd get any. But now that they've had a little taste, they're hooked. Brandon, who was bullied by Chase almost as much as Joel was, has turned into Chase's biggest fan. And none of those sheep who can stop raving about Chase's amazing suggestions for my national journalism contest entry. I can think of a lot of words to describe Chase, and amazing isn't one of them. Except maybe that it's amazing he isn't in jail. On the other hand, well, the contest is important to me, and it's not like I've got a better idea. I did a little research on the Medal of Honor. Turns out to be just as special as Chase says it is. Even a broken clock gives the correct time twice a day, though. I figure I'll go talk to Mr. Solway. Even if he really did win a Medal of Honor, I owe it to myself to check him out. On the walk over to Portland Street, my phone rings. A message from Joel, JW Piano Man. Where are you? Shosh. In town? JW. Hot day? Yeah, right. With a guy who might be at least 80, I thumb back. Shosh. Video club business. JW Piano Man. Question mark? Shosh. Meeting possible subject for video contest. Korean war hero. JW Piano Man. Wow. Where'd you find him? I hesitate. I never told Joel that while he's suffering at Melton, Chase has moved in and taken over his spot in the video club. It would only make a miserable situation worse, and I'm definitely not going to admit that Chase put me on to Mr. Solway. I don't like keeping secrets from my brother, but there are some things you just can't say. Maybe in a few months, if Joel starts fitting in at board at boarding school and making some friends there, or at least not hating it, I can break the news to him and he won't care so much. So I message back, friend of a friend. I put away my phone, praying that. Sorry, I keep yawning, y'all. I put away my phone, praying that he doesn't ask for more information. Joel is a cross between a prosecuting attorney and a bloodhound if he gets any idea that you're holding out on him, especially when he's lonely and bored with nothing better to do than think about home. At Portland Street, I ask the desk, and they direct me to room 121. As I make my way through the halls, I get a sense of just how some elderly, how elderly some of the residents must be. My grandfather is 73, and he still rollerblades every morning. These people are way older than him. A lot of them must be in their 90s, and maybe even over 100. The door of 121 is ajar, so when I knock on it, it swings open. Mr. Solway, I ask tentatively. A gruff voice announces, We don't want any. I'm, uh, not selling anything. I step further into the room and get my first view of him. I can't see him directly since he's facing away from me, watching the news channel on the TV. He's short but sturdy, with white, thick white hair. I just want to talk to you. I'm in the video club for my school, and... You call yourself a governor, he bellows suddenly at the TV. You couldn't run a hot dog cart. You're an idiot. I keep talking. I do that when I'm nervous. And there's this national video contest where you have to interview a senior citizen who's had an amazing life. He turns his chair and fixes me with a burning gaze. Do I know you? I'm still babbling. And I heard you were awarded the Medal of Honor in the Korean War. He reddens. Is that what this is about? That medal doesn't make me any more special than a lot of other people who were there. Go interview one of them and leave me out of it. I'm just trying to be reasonable. Don't you want the story to be told? No, it's my story. It's enough for me to know it. By now I've caught sight of the picture of President Truman hanging the medal around a younger Mr. Solway's neck, and I'm convinced that he has to be my subject. 
a lot of my kids, a lot of kids my age don't understand the sacrifices people like you made for our country. Don't flatter me, kid. I'm 86 years old and there's precious little left of me to flatter. I don't want to be interviewed. I don't want to be thanked. All I want is for the dining room to stop serving creamed spinach. I'm completely defeated. The guy's impossible. Absolutely determined to stew in his own misery. He almost reminds me of Joel, who is so ticked off at where he ended up that he can't allow himself to try to make the best of it. Because then he'd have nothing to complain about. And complaining is the only thing that keeps him going. The difference is that Joel has every right to be angry at the curveball life pitched to him. This old creep is just plain mean. I'm about to back out of the door in defeat when a familiar voice announces, Good news, Mr. Solway, I snagged the last prune Danish. There he is, the alpha rat of my family's nightmares, bearing a pastry on a paper plate. He's got a name tag on proclaiming to be Chase, volunteer. The change in Mr. Solway is incredible. His crabby glower morphs into a grin that lights up the room. Come to think of it, it makes perfect sense. Who can cheer up a miserable jerk who would never give anybody else the skin of a grape? Only another miserable jerk. Someone even nastier and more selfish. The two of them were made for each other. Then Chase notices me. Oh, uh, hi, Shoshana. His smile disappears when I glare at him. Wait a minute, Mr. Solway exclaims. Is she your friend, Chase? He nods. We're in video club together. I'm the one who suggested you for her project. The old soldier, old soldier thinks it over and comes to a conclusion with a curt nod. That makes it different. I'd be happy to help the two of you out. I don't like the sound of that. I don't have a partner for this contest, and even if I did, the last person on earth I'd ever choose would be Chase Ambrosi. But if I say that to Mr. Solway, I'll get kicked out again. This time, for good. I turn furious eyes on Chase. He gazes innocently back at me. I know that somewhere deep inside he's laughing at me. It looks like I have a partner, whether I want one or not, and I don't. How am I ever going to explain this to Joel? All right, y'all, that's where we're going to end today. Um, make sure you're answering those questions. Page two. There's two pages. Make sure you're doing both pages, please, okay? Um, get this turned in by the end of the day. Hope you all are staying safe, and I will see you on here tomorrow.